The Rules Committee will come to order. Uh, I want to welcome everyone to the, the first ever virtual hearing of the House Committee on the House Rules Committee. I know this is new, so we're going to take plenty of time. We're in no rush. Uh, and um, and so um, if there are some glitches here, we'll, we'll work them out along the way. Uh, today, we're considering Senate amendments to uh, H.R. 6172, the USA uh, Freedom Reauthorization Act. Um, you know, let me uh, just say I've never, uh, I have personally have never supported the Pfizer program, and I think there's a better way to prevent terrorism and criminality than in, by encroaching on the privacy of law-abiding Americans. Uh, and um, and so I, um, you know, uh, and I and I'm not, uh, and I know that there are strong feelings, uh, uh, not so much along partisan lines, because there are Democrats who support the Pfizer program and Democrats who oppose it, and Republicans who support the Pfizer program and Republicans who oppose it. Uh, but um, in any event, um, you know, we're going to uh, we, we're moving this to the floor and uh, there are some uh, reforms that are being uh, proposed by, uh, by some of our members that we're going to hear about today. Um, and so um, having said that, uh, you know, I this is the beginning of a of a, uh, you know, of, uh, you know, of the process. And I would now uh, uh, I want to thank our witnesses, but I would now like to yield to our ranking member, Mr. Cole, for any comments he has to uh, make. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, want to once again thank the staff, which is helping facilitate this, and I think doing a, a great job as we work through this for the very first time uh, in, uh, in a real-life situation. Uh, we're here today for the second time on a bill to reauthorize the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, or FISA. Getting to this point has uh, been the result of long negotiation process that's encompassed both parties and both houses of Congress. Unfortunately, I don't believe we have reached a final product that can pass both the House and the Senate and that can be signed into law. I think all members of the House appreciate the importance of FISA. FISA provides our national security apparatus and our intelligence services with unique intelligence gathering capabilities, primarily focused on terrorists and those who would wish our country and our people harm. It allows us to track foreign terrorists on foreign soil and ensures that we can continue to track electronic communications of international terror networks like the Islamic State and Al-Qaeda. In short, it's been an effective and critical tool in protecting the United States national security. But in our modern interconnected world, we must also strike a balance. We must protect the homeland while simultaneously ensuring that we do not abuse these powers. In particular, we must be vigilant to protect civil liberties and the privacy of American citizens. In the event that abuses occur, we must be sure that the FISA statute includes provisions that will allow us to hold those responsible accountable for their actions. Above all else, we must be sure that FISA is never used or abused for partisan political purposes. This balance is difficult to strike. If we continue to work in a bipartisan fashion, I'm confident that Congress will reach the appropriate balance. We can both protect our national security and protect the privacy of individuals. Congress is capable of walking and chewing gum at the same time, and I believe we can and will ultimately reach the appropriate balance in FISA. However, I'm not sure, Mr. Chairman, that we've reached it yet. So thank you. I look forward to the hearing and the contributions of our witnesses, and I yield back. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and again, I, I let me echo what you just said about thanking the staff for helping us kind of uh, get through uh, this process virtually, and uh, we appreciate all their hard work. Uh, and I'd like to welcome our witnesses uh, to provide testimony in H.R. 6172, the USA Freedom Reauthorization Act of 2020. Um, I, I want to welcome Mr. Raskin uh, and Mr. Jordan. Uh, I want to thank you for being here and uh, for providing testimony. And without objection, any written materials you submit to rulesdocuments at mail.house.gov before the conclusion of this hearing will be entered into the record. I'm now uh, happy to recognize the gentleman from Maryland, uh, Mr. Raskin. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, good morning. Uh, good morning, good morning, Mr. Cole. Good morning to uh, all of uh, our wonderful colleagues on the Rules Committee. Uh, last night, I was uh, contacted by uh, Chairman Nadler's office, and they asked whether I could present his statement uh, on his behalf, and I'm delighted to do so. So I will read his statement to you uh, verbatim. Uh, and here it goes. Thank you, Chairman McGovern. The bill before us has been through this committee before, so I will keep my remarks brief. H.R. 6172, the USA Freedom Reauthorization Act, 
reauthorizes three provisions of FISA that sunset in March, makes a long list of reforms to improve the underlying statute, and thanks to your support, incorporates two important amendments that were considered in the United States Senate. The first amendment was introduced in the Senate by Senators Lee and Leahy and passed the Senate with overwhelming bipartisan support. At its core, this amendment expands the role of the court-appointed amicus in the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. If the court finds the, appropriate, the appointment appropriate, an amicus will now be present in cases involving significant First Amendment concerns, involving sensitive investigations like those targeting a media organization or a specific religious group, and authorizations for programmatic surveillance like the annual renewal for surveillance under Section 702. The Biden process clearly needs more oversight. And in recent years, we have seen how important it is to have an amicus present to test the government's assertions in the FISA court. The second amendment was introduced by Senators Wyden and Gaines. It failed with only 59 votes in the Senate. Notably, two senators who were absent that day said that they would have supported the measure had they been present to vote. After a long negotiation with Chairman Nadler and Chairman Schiff, Representatives Lofgren and Davidson have introduced a similar bipartisan amendment here in the House. This amendment prohibits the government from using Section 215 to obtain the internet browsing and search histories of United States persons. Most Americans see an obvious privacy interest in that kind of information, and we should celebrate a change that brings the statute in line with that understanding. These two amendments improve on the underlying bill, which I support and urge you to support. Um, and at that point, uh, Chairman Nadler yielded back. And uh, at this point, what I will do is um, simply repose this to the wisdom of the Rules Committee to figure out all of the different dimensions of where we are. And with that, I yield back to you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Jordan, welcome. And uh, you can proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman uh, and uh, Mr. Ranking Member. It's good to be with you this morning. Uh, I want to thank you for the opportunity to talk about this important legislation. Since this bill first passed the House in March of this year, the Inspector General for the Department of Justice issued a management alert highlighting urgent deficiencies in how FISA applications were predicated. That alert came on the heels of a scathing report detailing significant failures in the FISA program, highlighting the urgent need for these changes to be signed into law. Over the past few months, Inspector General Horowitz confirmed what many of us long knew to be true. The FBI abused the system and duped the court into allowing it to spy on a U.S. presidential campaign in the months leading up to the election. It is now beyond dispute that the Carter Page FISA, that was the FBI's inroad to spying on the Trump campaign, should never have been granted. The IG documented, quote, multiple instances in which factual assertions relied upon in the first FISA application were inaccurate, incomplete, or unsupported by appropriate documentation. Based upon the information the FBI had in its possession at the time the application was filed. In other words, they knew it was false when they did it. In fact, Mr. Horowitz's review found 51 factual assertions in the Carter Page FISA applications that either had no supporting documentation, their supporting document did not state facts, or the supporting document showed factual assertion that was just incorrect. And it wasn't just the Carter Page FISA that had problems. These abuses were systematic and potentially, um, excuse me, systemic and potentially systematic. In a management advisory mem memorandum dated March 30th, 2020, just two months ago, concerning the Woods file, the materials collected to substantiate the need for a FISA, the inspector general found fault in 25 Woods files in, F in FISA's targeting U.S. persons that his office was able to review. Most troubling, the FBI was unable to locate four Woods files DOJ, uh, the, the Department of Justice IG requested. This should never happen in America. Fortunately, this bill makes important structural reforms to the program to combat such abuses. For instance, Carter, Pi Carter Page didn't get an amicus assigned to his FISA case. This bill makes explicit that an amicus should be assigned to all U.S. person cases involving sensitive investigative matters. The amicus will help the court assess the accuracy and merits of an application. This bill also authorizes independent legal advisors to look for concerns, provide requirements for the approval of all U.S. person applications. It requires the attorney general to promulgate procedures to ensure that all U.S. person FISA applications are accurate and complete. 
The IG is also required to annually assess compliance with accuracy procedures. That's critically important when we think about the history and what the IG just determined was happening in the, in the recent past. The Carter Page application was full of omissions and errors. Lawyers who fill out the FISA application now have to reveal any information that calls into question the accuracy of a U.S. person's application. There was no one person in the, a person in the, in the FBI who had the responsibility to make sure the Carter Page application was accurate. At every agency that submits FISA applications, this bill establishes a new, quote, Office of Compliance to ensure the accuracy of all U.S. person FISA applications. Furthermore, this legislation puts a significant onus on the Attorney General. The bill requires that he, Attorney General, approve in writing the FISA investigation of an elected official or federal candidate, which goes to the heart of preserving our democratic institution. Most importantly, this bill includes accountability measures. FBI lawyers involved in the Carter Page application engaged in misconduct and weren't punished. Now someone who knowingly hides information from the court of any U.S. person shall face appropriate adverse actions, including as appropriate suspension without pay or removal. This bill makes it a crime punishable by contempt to willfully make a false statement to the FISA court regarding any U.S. person case. It increases the maximum imprisonment from five to eight years for improperly engaging in electronic surveillance or disclosing information obtained via unauthorized electronic surveillance for any U.S. person. It also includes reforms that strengthen Congress's oversight powers. Department of Justice took months to give Carter Page related documents to Congress. This bill requires the DOJ to give FISA applications and relevant materials to Congress in a much more timely manner. Finally, I would like to thank Senators Lee and Leahy for their amendment to the House passed bill, which strengthens, uh, strengthens the amicus role in these proceedings by extending them to any sensitive investigative matter involving U.S. persons. And I also fully support this inclusion as well of the Lofgren-Davidson Amendment to limit the FBI's ability to obtain internet browsing history of Americans. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'd be happy to answer questions. I yield back. Uh, thank you very, very much. Um, uh, I, just have, I just have one question. Um, yesterday, the, the president uh, tweeted that he had urge all Republicans to uh, vote against uh, the FISA bill. Uh, is there any update? Is he still opposed? Uh, is he is he, is he going to veto this, or what is the? Does anyone know what that what that what what he means there? I I, I don't think we, we can't hear you. Uh, okay. Okay. Awesome. Um, look, we all know what the president went through, Chairman. Um, this this process the, that that 17 different uh, factual assertions that were just not accurate, all kinds of things he went through. So he is frustrated uh, by this process, and he wants to continue to work to improve this process and make sure that. I'm just asking whether he's going to veto it because I'm just uh, based on that tweet. I, I don't know whether you I know. Think that. The, I think. I think before he can even before that that question can be answered, we got to know if this is going to pass the pass the House of Representatives today. So, um, you know, I I think we'll wait and well, wait. We, well that, that I mean the, the administration usually issues guidance before we vote on bills. So I was just I was just asking for clarification. But if you yeah. don't know, that's fine. Um, I'm happy now to turn to our ranking member, Mr. Cole, for any questions he may have. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to thank uh, our witness for being here and all his hard work on. Thank on the you. FISA issue, he's done a, a great job, and uh, I'm like uh, my good friend from Ohio. I'm waiting to hear uh, a little bit more from the president because at the end of the day, uh, if we don't have an agreement between the two parties and the two chambers and the president, then I think this legislation is very unlikely to pass. So uh, again, I'll uh, I'll withhold my questions for now, uh, but uh, again, look forward as the situation unfolds and we learn a little bit more. Uh, again, as my friend from Ohio suggested, I think without presidential support, this is very unlikely to pass because as you said, Mr. Chairman, at the very beginning, there's considerable division within both parties uh, about this now, and it'd be very difficult to uh, muster a majority in my view and, until there's actually agreement all the way around, so to speak. So with that, I yield back. Uh, Mr. Torres. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't have any questions for the witnesses. I do have a um, statement I would like to um, state, but when we're done with all the witnesses and panels, thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Woodall. 
Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll ask. Uh, I'll ask you before I ask uh, Mr. Jordan. It, it, I don't think there's anybody who believes this is headed uh, uh, for passage in the absence of the of the uh, Lofgren Davidson amendment. Uh, is there a a plan for uh, uh, for uh, making that a, a self enacting thing? Is that part of our conversation uh, today? Or are we talking about sending that to the floor for a separate vote? Could you? Uh, because that that'll that'll make a difference to the questions I have for Mr. Jordan. Yeah, well, that that'll that'll be the subject of our markup, which which we will um, uh, conduct um, at some point after this hearing. But I mean, clearly, we're we're I mean, we're having a hearing now to listen to what's being offered and to consider uh, what our options may be. But we will be meeting on that a little bit later uh, after this hearing. Okay, I, I I wasn't trying to get into into secret information. I no, thought not secret. That... I mean, I, I think you know, there's there, there are a lot of strong opinions here, and we're trying to. You know, consider all of those opinions uh, before we have a markup, so that we, when we move this bill to the floor, that we're doing it in a, in 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 the, in the best way possible. Yeah, yeah I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Jordan, I, I I don't know, uh, I don't know how we uh, say you need to obey the law uh, more clearly than we already do. Uh, in this uh, in this case, I know I've got a lot of constituents uh, uh, who have that concern. Uh, well, great, Rob, you're going to come back and you're going to make it even even clearer uh, that absolutely positively uh, these protections must happen. But you told me last time, Rob, that absolutely positively these protections must happen, and they didn't. Uh, I know you have been uh, working on this uh, harder than than uh, almost anyone else uh, in Congress. Um, if we have uh, the underlying uh, FISA bill with the Lofgren Davidson uh, amendment added to it. Can I look my constituents in the eye back home and say we are absolutely positively doing more to protect you today than we did yesterday? And we have now additional safeguards in place uh, so that if there are uh, uh, bureaucrats somewhere in that chain who don't want to follow the law, we've got independent folks who are keeping an eye on them this time around. I think you have to press on mute. Uh, I, I keep it, uh, just so you know, Mr. Chairman, I keep it unmuted, but you, you, the staff is muting me each time. So I oh, I'm sorry, then I, my, our staff, we need to make sure we unmute. Yeah, them. and then I, I, I haven't hit the button. Um, yeah, with, there's definitely, you can definitely say that, Mr. Woodall, to your constituents, that there is more protection here. But frankly, the President wants even more. I'm willing to continue to work to make this bill even better. But I do think the product in front of us is a is a huge improvement from where we were uh, previously. And understand what Mr. Horowitz told us two months ago. This was 29 cases, randomly picked 29 cases of U.S. persons, where they, they found that in every single one there were major problems. And in four of those 29 cases, they couldn't even find the Woods file, which is that file you keep that has the underlying documentation and support for what you then take to the FISA court. So that's how egregious this was. This bill definitely improves that situation. I'm convinced of that. But if the President of the United States, who was so aggrieved by this process, wants to continue to work to improve it, God bless him. I'm willing to continue to work to make sure we get it even better if we can. And that's 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 what we'll debate today, I think, here in, here in, uh, here in D.C. Well, I thank you for being uh, uh, here with us uh, today, even when you're muted, because we're looking eye to eye at each other. I can still hear uh, all of your uh, uh, all of your words, but I appreciate you making the effort uh, uh, to be here. And I appreciate all your leadership on this issue, not just uh, on this bill, uh, but over the many years uh, that you've been providing that. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. And let me just say to the witnesses that every time you speak, you need to unmute. Um, you have to take the initiative to unmute in order to be able to be heard. So. Uh, you control that. Um, uh, at this point, I'd like to turn to Mr. Perlmutter. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. I supported uh, this bill when it passed the House uh, a couple months ago. I think uh, the Lofgren Amendment improves it. I think the Wyden Amendment that uh, was proposed in the Senate improves it. So I, uh, I support this legislation. I think it's very important uh, for us and uh, for our national security. And uh, I think there are a lot of privacy components that have been added, and uh, uh, I think then that has uh, developed a balance that I think is key to something like this. And with that, I uh, yield back. Thank you. Dr. Burgess. 
Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, you see one of the technical problems involved in a remote hearing. So, um, Mr. Jordan, the question I, I have is one that I get from constituents back home, much along the lines that Mr. Woodall does. <clears throat> it was already illegal to lie to a judge to obtain a FISA warrant. Is that not correct? That's right. So, but from your recitation of the facts that you gave us, and, and I appreciate what you, what you took us through, it sounds like that happened not just once, but multiple times. Yep, sure did. So, and I'm not a lawyer, but were there multiple crimes committed during each one of those false assertions to a federal judge to obtain a FISA warrant? Well, the short answer is, Mr. Uh, Dr. Burgess, we, we don't know. That's why there's an investigation, uh, investigation ongoing that the Attorney General of the United States has tasked U.S. Attorney John Durham to conduct. Um, the Attorney General has indicated that sometime this summer, we will, that, that investigation will be completed and we'll, I assume, get some kind of report, hopefully, uh, maybe even hold people accountable. Uh, I think chief among those should be the former FBI Director, Jim Comey. Remember what the Attorney General said the first time he testified in a hearing in front of the United States Congress. He said there was a failure of leadership at the upper echelon of the FBI in the previous administration. That is most certainly true. Jim Comey was fired. Andy McCabe was fired. Jim Baker was let go, was under indictment. Peter Strzok was fired. Lisa Page was let go, left, left the um, uh, FBI. So those were the five key people who ran the biggest investigations of our lifetime. So let's hope someone is held accountable, but we can't do that. We can just structure the law in the best way possible with the best process, protocols, and safeguards in place to protect the liberties that we all have under the United States Constitution. That's what we're trying to do. The only one that can hold people accountable for the wrongdoing, of course, is the Justice Department. And they are looking at that very issue as we speak. And we will expect some kind of some kind of decision um, when the investigation is completed later this summer. So I've got many of the same difficulties that Mr. Woodall expressed. And the constituents are asking why are we to believe you now uh, that things that people really will do what they're supposed to do. Wouldn't we have a better argument to those constituents if we could point to someone who has in fact been charged, or tried, and found whether they're guilt or innocence? And and look, we've got people that just, you know, as a result of the Mueller investigation, people who've had to be compassionately released from prison because under the COVID pandemic. Yep. And, and I don't understand. I don't understand. And, and people back home don't understand. How can you come down so hard on someone for a, a violation of the FARA statutes and you ignore this? Yeah. Why, why was someone held in jail with under a gag order before they were even convicted? Solitary confinement before they were convicted and yet this, which is probably the largest single political crime of our lifetimes, and we lived through Watergate, we're the same yep. age. Yep. I, I just don't, I don't, I don't get it. Yeah, well, you I, don't... I would feel better about voting for this if I could look to someone who is actually spending time in, yeah. under, under federal custody for having lied to a federal judge. So we would all know you don't ever lie to a federal judge because really bad things will happen to you. Yeah. Right now, I, I don't know that anyone believes that. Well, you don't get it. I don't get it. And, and, and maybe most importantly, the American people don't get it. They're sick of the double standard. You know, one set of rules for us regular folk, a different set for the, the politically connected in, in the upper in the higher offices in, in, in Washington, D.C. So, uh, look, if, if Mr. Durham can show that there was intent and they, they knew it and can can demonstrate that people are going to be uh, people are going to be held accountable. Um, We'll just we'll just have to to wait and let the investigation um, investigation play out. But I certainly hope that there are people held accountable for this. Uh, remember, one one other example is this is from Horowitz's report on the Carter Page FISA from December. Is 
the lawyer falsified the document. He changed the meaning of the document that was taken to the court. How about that individual? So I don't know the status of that individual. I mean, I don't want to even say the name here, but it's like that lawyer falsified. That's clearly in the report. That's got to be a crime. So maybe they're talking. I don't know what's going on there, but um, let's certainly hold people accountable who did wrong. I would just say it would be easier for me to vote on this if I could point to that having already happened and not. I hope it happens yeah. down the road. Um, and, and let me just ask you this, and I understand the reason the language is the way it is, but it also looks like we exempt ourselves from where we say an elected official. If, and I, I think I understand the reason for that, because obviously this was a political crime directed at a at a political candidate. But it also looks like we're exempting ourselves. Yeah, yeah that's certainly not the intent. The, the, the intent is to when when you're something that politically sensitive, where uh, <clears throat> the Justice Department is going to go spy on a uh, person running for high office or a, a member of of the United States Congress, the Attorney General, him or herself needs to sign that application. So the, the buck's got to stop at the top for something that's significant, it seems to me. And that, that's that's what happened in, in effect. They um, they spied on, they, they took a application to get a warrant to surveil Carter Page because, it, you know, who was part of the major party's political campaign. So um, that's what that's designed to do. And then the Lee Amendment grants uh, an advocate there for the person who's going to be surveilled, the Lee Amendment says, not just in that situation, but any politically sensitive issue, you're talking about surveilling a church or, or anything that's sort of fundamental to, to basic liberty, um, the Lee Amendment is, is added for that reason as well. It's a, it's a good amendment. Yeah, I just don't know in, in any of our lifetimes we could have imagined the weaponization of this process to this degree. And I realize there are other things that occupy the front pages right now, but this really was the crime of the century that was almost committed. And we're so, so darn fortunate as a country that they weren't successful. And we might've never known, had they had they been successful, we, we would have never known. And that's really what bothers me more than anything else about this. Um, I don't even know where you are, Mr. Chairman, but I'll yield back. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, no, I, I think we have a different uh, opinion of, of what happened and, and that's okay, I guess, uh, but um, I think a lot of people I talk to are horrified that um, uh, people close to the president or in the administration would de deliberately lie to the FBI about dealing with Russian operatives uh, and then um, have the president come to their aid and basically uh, Im uh, imply that uh, they will get a pardon because they're close to him and they're his friends. I mean, I think uh, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of concern about what happened and about the involvement of Russia in the last presidential campaign. Uh, but uh, I will we'll just, I mean, it is what it is, but uh, I'm now happy to yield to Ms. Scanlon. Thank you. Um, I don't have any questions for the witness. I just want to thank the staff again for organizing the hearing. It's so important that we able be able to conduct business under the current conditions, and I'm grateful that we have the technology to do it. So thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Mrs. Lesko. I think you have to unmute. Oh, you, you just. Just going to pause until we get Mrs. Lesko connected here. This is Lesko, can you hear us?
Ms. Chairman, this uh, she's working right now, okay. trying to get there, and doesn't have her earphones in yet. Well, what? What? Okay, if you don't mind, maybe we'll go to Mr. Morelli and then come back to Mrs. Lesko. Is that okay? Uh, let me check with Ms. Lesko, but I suspect okay. it is. Deb, could we move on and come back to you? That'd be fine, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Morelli. Yeah, I'm good, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. All right, Ms. Ms. <laughs> Ms. Shalala. <laughs> You gotta unmute. No, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. You have no you no know, questions? No comments. Okay. No questions. Thank you. Um Ms. M Mrs. Matsui. You gotta unmute. Thank you very much, Mr. Sure. Chairman. I want to thank uh, everyone for their technical assistance during this process. And I also want to uh, say that this is an important bill that we're looking at today, and uh, I believe it's uh, amendments make it better. And I'm looking forward to uh, not only this uh, hearing, but also the uh, the markup and debate on the floor. So I yield back. Thank you. Thank you. I uh, will go back to Mrs. Lesko. See you there. There you go. We're almost there, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, that's almost. okay. We're... Me now. I, I got you. Okay, I had to use Mrs. Mr. Burgess's <laughs> tablet. Can I say? Can I say on the record, this is a terrible process and I think we should get rid of this. I think we, I think we got that impression because you're suing us. So, but thank you very much. We know it's out of love, so. But that, I sued you before I knew how terrible the process was in the committee. We have reverberations here. Somebody talks here in person, we hear it like, a few seconds later, it's very distracting. I have well, to have two laptops to see my documents and then see you guys. It's very uh, disturbing and hard to do business. Well, maybe, maybe, maybe you, you might consider if we do this again, doing it in your office uh, without all the, all the distractions, but people do this all the time in business and in other uh, in other, in other jobs. It's, it's, so we, we're just gonna have to try to adjust uh, and hopefully this is not for very long. Uh, uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do have a question for Mr. Jordan. Sure. Uh, um, what happens, Mr. Jordan? I mean, my understanding is that we put in the FISA court, commonly known as FISC, uh, because there was abuses prior to having the court. So, you know, the surveillance FBI uh, went out prior to the court and uh, we're spying on US citizens and recording US citizens. And so if we don't reauthorize this um, with reforms to the FISA application in court, what happens in your opinion? If we didn't reauthorize FISA at all? Whoa. Uh, yes. Well, the, the, the current, current cases that are, you know, already in place would continue, but there could be no new cases taken to the FISA court, no new surveillance done on on um, on anyone. So uh, that, that's a situation, frankly, we're in right now because it hasn't been reauthorized. Um, and, you know, if that's where the if that's where the Congress and the president want to go, that's one thing. Uh, my, my gut tells me there's probably not the votes for that in the in here on Capitol Hill. Uh, and that's why we've been trying to work on the reforms we have in place. But as I said earlier, I think this is good reforms, good, you know, particularly with the Davidson Amendment and, and with the Lee Amendment on the Senate side. But if the president wants to continue to, to work and make it even better, God bless him. I'm, I'm all for that as well. But Mr. Jordan, correct me if I'm wrong, weren't there abuses prior to, oh, yeah. uh, to this no. act? And so why wouldn't it just go back to that? Well, you're right. The FISA court was was created. The FISA process was created to deal with abuses in the previous administration years ago. Um, but the reform itself, there, the abuse took place there. So the, the, the reform mechanism was the FISA court, but that became 
you know, that was abused, uh, as we all know, now based on Mr. Horowitz's report, based on what we've learned in the last several years, um, not only what took place with the president and the Carter Page and, and what they did with that FISA application, but the more general, understand too, the memo that Inspector General Horowitz put out in March, he's just started his investigation in a broader look at the overall FISA, but it was what he saw just initially with these 29 randomly selected cases of U.S. citizens, what he saw was just so wrong, he, it was the equivalent of pulling the firing alarm and saying, wait a minute, I got I to gotta do something here on the front end to tell the Congress and tell the country this is a big problem. And it's not just Carter Page and, and what happened to the president, as bad as and terrible as that was, it's broader than that. So he pulls the fire alarm, issues the memo back on March 20th. That's what this is. That's why we really need to change this program with the right kind of reforms. And, and again, if we got to keep working to get it right, that's that's fine. We'll do it. But that's that's how big and significant this problem is. I agree. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I yield back. Thank you. Does anyone other member of the committee wish to ask a question of Mr. Raskin or Mr. Jordan? Seeing none, I'd like to thank them both for their testimony, and you are now excused. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I, uh, I now want to welcome our next panel, Ms. Loughran, Mr. David, and Mr. Gomer. I'm going to take a minute to get them all get connected, and then we will, if she is ready, we will begin with Ms. Loughran. Don't, don't start yet, uh, so just hold one second. Okay, so uh, Ms. Lofkin, you can begin. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman McGovern and Ranking Member Cole. First, I'd like to ask that my full statement be made a part of the record. Without objection. And, and I'd like to just uh, first go through very quickly uh, what this amendment does. It prohibits the government from using Section 15 of the Navy Act to authorize or require the disclosure of business records that contain the web browsing information or search history information of U.S. persons. It also requires the government to disclose in congressional and public reports how much web browsing and search history information it collects under Section 215. Now, before going into more specifics about the protection this amendment offers, I want to give a very brief recap on how we got to this point. On February 26, there was a markup scheduled in the Judiciary Committee, but it was canceled due to a number of bipartisan amendments I was planning to offer that were going to pass. A version of this amendment was one of them. So was a version of the amendment offered by Senators Lee and Leahy, which ultimately passed the Senate and is why the House is once again considering reauthorizing these authorities. Instead, the bill was brought immediately to the House floor for a vote on March 11th without the opportunity for members to have a chance to vote on reform, I believe would have made a real difference and would have passed. On May 13th, the Senate overwhelmingly passed one significant reform amendment and just barely missed the 60 votes needed to pass a second. This has shown that the House should have been able to have its votes on amendments, and I'm glad we finally have an opportunity for such a vote today. Now, I know concerns have been raised about limiting this amendment to just U.S. persons. Uh, in my ideal amendment, I would not have included this limitation, but I was led to understood that a compromise might be necessary in order to get a vote. In a bipartisan letter sent to this committee on May 20th, Mr. Davidson and I asked for an amendment to be put in order that mirrored the widen Bain Senate amendment. That is and remains our preferred amendment. And I leave it to the wisdom of this committee should they want to consider an, an, an amendment identical to the one offered by Senators Wyden and Bain. But this is not the only provision that the House will be voting on to, to reauthorize with such a limitation. <clears throat> All three authorities being re, uh, reauthorized have protections 
that apply only to U.S. persons. The lone wolf, wolf provision only applies to non-U.S. Uh, uh, persons. The roving wiretap provision cannot be used on a U.S. person where the sole basis for the investigation is a First Amendment protected uh, conduct. And Section 215 itself says it cannot be used on a U.S. person where the sole basis of the investigation is First Amendment protected conduct. Non-U.S. persons are not afforded such protection. In 2015, the House voted 338 to 88 to reauthorize these provisions to protections only for U.S. persons. <clears throat> but let's not be uh, mistaken, this amendment does offer real protection, and it's because it is a strict liability prohibition. It prohibits orders requiring the production of business records unless the government is sure that what is returned will not have the web browsing information or search information of a U.S. person. On a practical level, this prohibits dragnet collection, which offers protections that extend beyond just U.S. persons. I want to make clear on its face what this amendment prohibits. Unlike other authorities in FISA, there is no intentionality or reasonable belief required. This is a blanket prohibition on collecting the web browsing and search history of a U.S. person. The government cannot use Section 215 to collect records that contain the websites the U.S. person visits, the videos that a U.S. person watches, or the search queries that a U.S. person makes. If the government is not sure if you're a U.S. person, which it could be, it cannot seek an order for the websites you visit, YouTube videos you watch, or search queries you make. If the government wants to use a dragnet and order a service provider to produce a list of everyone, who has visited a particular website, watched a particular YouTube video, or made a, a, a search query, they cannot seek that order unless it can guarantee that the business records returned will contain no U.S. person IP addresses, device identifiers, or other U.S. person identifiers. For the government to continue to allow such dragnet collection flies in the face of the intent of this amendment. In order to do, to do so, the FISA court would have to adopt a reading of this amendment that says, even though you know for a fact that asking for the IP address of everyone who visited a website is going to capture <coughs> substantial U.S. person's web, web browsing information, since you didn't say that you wanted U.S. person information, then it doesn't count. That doesn't make any sense at all. It's an absurd interpretation. Such a dragnet type order by its very na nature requires the production of U.S. person information. And to say that the government isn't seeking that when it knows full well, full well what it will get would be disingenuous. This amendment is intended to be a fundamental change to Section 215 and should be interpreted as what it clearly means, a prohibition on any order that would result in the disclosure of U.S. person web browsing and search history information. I would finally uh, state that uh, some comments have been made suggesting that there is ambiguity uh, in this amendment. I think clearly there is not, but if the committee wants to make sure that there is no ambiguity whatsoever, they could revert to the original request Mr. Davidson and I made on May 20th, a mirror of the uh, widen Danes Amendment. I'll close with this. It has been a pleasure to work mm -hmm. with Mr. Davidson on this amendment. We've got a, a bipartisan a group of members uh, supporting this effort. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you very much. And uh, I want to thank you for providing testimony. Again, let me just say any written materials that anyone wants to submit, uh, you should submit it to rules documents at mail.house.gov before the conclusion of this hearing. Um, and uh, without objection, we'll be entered into the record. I now recognize Mr. Davidson. Mr. Chairman, I think his uh, internet is uh, down or something. Hmm. Yes. Mr. Davison? His internet seems to be down. Okay, should we go to Mr. Gomert? Okay, thank you. Well, am I unmuted? Yeah, yes. 
Okay, thank you. And Mr. Chairman, thanks for making this uh, so accommodating. I did come back to Washington to testify, but uh, because of the laptops being used even in the committee, I thought it'd be better to just do this from my office. And please understand, I'm not, by my comments, I'm not trying to talk down to anybody. I'm not capable of having a lofty enough perch to do that. But I think it is exceedingly important that we we look at what a judge would, should look at because we're creating this law that's supposed to be constitutional. It's been reauthorized a number of times, but the Fourth Amendment says the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated and no warrants shall issue, but upon probable cause supported by oath or affirmation and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. And, and I needed to point this out, I think, uh, so that you understand where I'm coming with my two amendments and my huge concerns about reauthorizing this. But in 2013, uh, y'all may all remember, uh, there was a disclosure of a FISA order with regard to Verizon. And I won't read the whole order, but as you know, as a felony judge, there's no telling how many uh, applications and affidavits uh, that I reviewed to see if there was probable cause, did it particularly describe the place to be searched and things to be seized. But when I saw this FISA order that a federally confirmed judge had signed, I was appalled. And, and I won't read the whole thing, just one line. This is the following tangible things described with particularity. Uh, it orders that all call detail records, all call detail records created by Verizon, and this is just part of it, but between the United States and abroad or wholly within the United States, including local telephone calls. In other words, a federal judge, FISA judge in secret, ordered Verizon, and we heard rumors that every phone company had gotten these, and the affidavit and the application had to have said, we just need every uh, American, everybody's abroad, foreigners, local American citizens, U.S. persons, everybody's call records Verizon had. Well, the Fourth Amendment, you just heard, it requires probable cause. You, you Under our justice system, and as a judge, I had to consider is there adequate, not just recitations or summaries, but actual facts asserted that prove a crime was probably committed and this person probably committed it so I could get those records? The FISA court doesn't have any of that. It, it is incredible. And, and to go back to 2005 uh, and six, but five when it was reauthorized, we had all these people coming from. Um, the Bush Justice Department telling us how important it was to reauthorize this. And they said, look at, look at this. It doesn't affect Americans. It doesn't abrogate any Americans uh, constitutional rights. So you don't have to worry. It only pertains to foreigners. And we had some behind the scenes discussions so they didn't have to do everything. But if a foreigner is either known to be a terrorist or known to be associated with a terrorist group, they don't have the same constitutional rights and we can go after them. And the only way an American ever gets caught up in this is if they happen to be uh, talking to, communicating with a foreign terrorist. And, and then to do that, we have to unmask them, and find out who that person is. Well, guess what? 15 years later, um, and I know that it's been said recently, look, we didn't even know who these numbers were, garbage. 
now it may have one time been metadata now we know and we can do searches for people's phone numbers and find out exactly who they're talking to so this is a different time than 2005 and so I, and i have the ultimate respect for jim jordan we agree on most everything i do not agree that the amendments make this uh, a good and effective bill and mr chairman i'm grateful that you have opposed this in the past it it needs vast reworking uh, with regard to the change that will change the sentence from five years to eight years if you're willing to lie in the face of a five-year sentence is an eight-year threat really going to stop you and on the other one assuring that the attorney general him or herself has to sign on we had that in this whole russia business rosenstein was the acting attorney general and he signed on and it there were representations that were false and nobody has been held to account and i i I appreciate um, the Lofgren Davidson amendment, but all it does is protect your internet searches. And as we know in this latest fiasco, that wasn't even what they went after. They were going after the individual phone calls. And even though FISA judges come from district courts or come from courts of appeal, somehow when they become part of the star chamber, the secret court, their training somehow goes out the window. These are smart people, but they're authorizing warrants against American citizens, which sure seems to me to be totally in ignoring the Fourth Amendment probable cause in an issue it's have you had any contact with a foreigner and then we find out that uh, gee we had senators that were being monitored because they talked not to terrorists not to somebody known terrorist uh, organization but an ambassador how i i don't know of any maybe some of y'all have never met an ambassador i'm not aware of any house members that have been here for any time at all that haven't met ambassadors. We do that as part of our job. And what we've seen is even that is enough justification in a FISA court to have you start being monitored. Well, he met with an ambassador. So this is this is really critical stuff. And, and I, I've been straight shooting all this time, be a little sarcastic perhaps, maybe that would bother you. But it sure seems strange to me for Democrats to vote for this reauthorization, even with these amendments, would have to sort of be saying, we have so much trust in Donald Trump and the people he's appointed that they would never do, never lie to a FISA court. They'd never just go after their enemies, um, that it's... Uh, we feel like he can be trusted and so can all the people he's appointed that would go before the FISA court. We know he's cleaned out some folks at the Justice Department, FBI. I mean, think about it. Uh, that's, I do trust him and I trust the people that have been appointed. My concern is this whole thing needs a huge reauthorization, a huge reworking. And I do have the two amendments and one, would prevent um, a, an American citizen from being uh, from having warrants issued by the FISA court. I want to look. I think it's true. Foreigners are uh, people outside the U.S. Foreigners, maybe people illegally in the U.S. They don't. Courts have indicated they don't have the same constitutional rights American citizens do. But for heaven's sake, at least American citizens ought to be afforded what the Fourth Amendment calls for. And that means if you want a warrant against a Democrat, Republican, independent, 
socialist, whoever, if they're an American citizen, you need to go to an Article Three court, it's not a secret court, and have a hearing. And, and I've held hearings in camera. There was some big secret involved. They did that before, and they can do it again. But if it involves an American, go to an Article Three district court to get your warrant if you can get it, if you've got probable cause, if you describe with particularly the places to be searched and the things to be seen. Because what we've been seeing, and I'm not encouraging at all uh, classified documents to be revealed. I'm just saying that that FISA order, when it, it went public, I could not believe any judge would have signed an order saying, yeah, just give them all your information on every single foreigner, American. So that's that's one amendment. And then the other, uh, apparently, uh, the threat of five years was not enough un under the uh, requirements of the law at that time. So my other amendment would make it easier to go after people who made misrepresentations to the uh, FISA court, uh, it would still have the five years, but it ought to pucker up folks because it allows not only to have willfully made mis false representations to the court, but also with extreme carelessness. So it wouldn't be a defense, oh, I was just careless. I didn't know uh, that that was not accurate. If you're gonna go take rights away from American citizens, even extreme carelessness ought to be enough to get you arrested. So I, I, I could go on and on, but this really concerns me and upsets me. This need, if it's going to be reauthorized at all, it, not political party thing, this is an American thing. And Mr. McGovern, I know that's been your concern about FISA from the, from the beginning. I did not have that insight in 2005 when I first got here, but I sure have them now, and I appreciate your concerns. Thank you very much for your thoughtful statement. I'm going to go now to Mr. Armstrong. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I so I. Not a fan of FISA. Um, I think anybody who knows how I've been in this uh, knows that. And but I also understand. I I appreciate uh, Congressman Gomert reading the Fourth Amendment because that really truly is what we're dealing with. And when we talk about national security, we're, that's what we're protecting, not just our citizens, but our law and the way we're doing things. And before I start, I, I with a little bit of testimony here, I think it's important to recognize not only the technical glitches and the way these things work, but uh, this town does partisan very well. A lot of times we do bipartisan better than people think. Where we tend to get in trouble is when you have these different coalitions. And I don't know if there's a different a place that could more aptly show that dynamic than a FISA reauthorization. Um, the first time we got this through, it, I mean, hung on by a thread and barely could get it through. And it's important. Um, and so one of the reasons we need to be here is for that, not just because of technical things, because deals get made, negotiations get finalized, and things happen, and they happen when we're here. And when we're scattered all over the United States, things that are as important as FISA and FISA reauth and FISA reform tend, tend to really be casualties of that. And that's what's going on right now. And I think it's important to understand that because I want to talk about where we're at, how we got here, and what we're talking about. First of all, FISA was originally introduced because prior to the FISA court, it was the Wild West. Um, there were no protections. There were and no no due, there was no due process, and so FISA was reintroduced. I concur completely with my colleagues who have talked about the um, abuses. What I do want to say about that is, most of these were abuses by people, and there and a lot of them were abuses by people in power, and a lot of them were abuses by people with badges. Now, I practiced federal criminal defense for almost a decade, and I can tell you we can write whatever we want, whatever reform we want. There is no procedural thing that we can do that will stop that. And that is the reality. We need better people. 
We need better people and we need to do a better job of holding them accountable, whether that's in a courtroom, whether it's on TV or whether it's in the halls of Congress. So we can pass all these reforms, we can leave it the way it is, but nothing is going to change until we get to a situation where we have people who, <laughs> quite frankly, have more humility, have more of a public servant's heart, and a little less prosecutorial or law enforcement hubris. But I, I will go back to what we're doing here. And what we're doing here, I think it's important to understand the places we want reform aren't up for reauthorization. So if we don't pass this bill or some bill like it very soon, there will be no reform. Not to the things that we have read about, not to the abuses. The portions, Title II is not up for, re or the, the accuracy and integrity of the process is not up for reform. FISA court reforms aren't up for, aren't, aren't up for reauthorization. And the congressional oversight uh, negotiations that occurred and that we got put in this are not up for reauthorization. So to my friends who I am completely and wholly sympathetic to, recognize that if we don't get anything done, it's back to business as usual. Tomorrow will be the same as yesterday. And next month will be the same as six months ago. That, and that being said, to my friends on the other side who think this is uh, these reforms cause problems to national security, uh, we agree. We need to we need the business records and re, and then the repeal of the call record. The loan rope provision is important. We deal with this thing and we deal with the universe and national security and the new world threats and as they occur. Um, roving wiretaps is just common sense law enforcement. Mr. Chairman, if I need a warrant, if I need a warrant on somebody, I shouldn't have to get one for their iPad and their iPhone. Uh, the warrant is on the warrant is on the person, not necessarily the particular uh, the particular piece of technology they are using at any given time. So, could this bill be a lot better? Absolutely. Um, but we need to recognize if we don't work for a better product, we are going to not reauthorize portions of this bill that are very important to our national security. And we are not going to reform the, pro the part portions of portions of FISA that we think are inherently needed of reform. So with that, I'm going to walk through a couple specific things. Um, Mr. Burgess brought up earlier that it seems like we exempt polit or politicians, and that's a that's a nice political argument, and it's true, and um, it never on its face looks all that great. But what we're really doing is protecting the political process, and so we're protecting the voters. None of us are altogether that important individually. The integrity of the elect, the integrity of U.S. elections are, and so they do. As we have seen in the very recent past, they do deserve a heightened level of security. Um, I, I, the reforms in here that I think are most telling, as far as the process is simply, uh, is the streamlining of the congressional oversight. There's more transparency. There is more strength in that transparency and probably more important, which we have seen over the last several years, the timeliness of that transparency is greatly executed. So I, I support both the amendments. I think browser, I, I think, um, browser history is important. I also think it's important to recognize that the Supreme Court, if we don't start acting on some of this, these privacy conversations in the 21st century, they're gonna do it for us. They have been right on Carpenter, and they have the U.S. Supreme Court has shown a willingness to reevaluate re how we treat Fourth Amendment protections in the digital age, and we shouldn't have to wait for the court, even even the highest court in the land, to make those decisions. We should be able to do it on our own. And so, as we go through this, this this is a very very imperfect solution to a very complex problem. But I can tell you from both sides, whether you're from whether you're the, from the Fourth Amendment side or the national security side, if we pass this or work towards a better product, both of those sides will be better off tomorrow than they were yesterday. And that's sometimes the best we can ask for in these situations. Getting rid, but it's important to recognize, not reauthorizing the portions we're dealing with today doesn't do anything for the portions that, that I am the most concerned about. And by on the other side, by resisting any reform to the portions we're concerned about, we end up putting our national security at risk as we continue to move forward. I wish we'd take the whole package as one, revamp the whole dang thing. Um, I'm still a little confused as to why we don't reauthorize the whole thing at once so we could actually have these conversations. But alas, we don't, so we're here. And we have a program here that actually does significant, substantial reform Again, if, we, if we're going to work to make that better, I'm all for it. 
and it also does a pretty good job of protecting our national security interests moving forward. Sure does a better job of that than not, reauthor not reauthorizing the portions that are there. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, and I saw Mr. Burr just walked back in, so I was just gonna tell him uh, when you were talking about the Farah uh, prosecutions, important to recognize Farah was never really prosecuted as a criminal offense until the Mueller investigation. Uh, that's really when that kind of, and, and by the way, with definite varying degrees of success. And the Logan Act has been on the books since 1799 and has never been prosecuted once. It's been indicted twice. The last time was 1850 and never moved forward. So this again goes to my argument of people. Um, if you don't have the right people in place, none of the procedural safeguards we put in, and if you don't have honest people in place, none of the procedural, uh, procedural safeguards we put in are going to be that. What this bill does do is, is increases congressional transparency more quickly and Hopefully, not only does it hold people more accountable, but I think more importantly in our current day and age, holds them more accountable quickly. So with that, I'll yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. D Mr. Davidson. There, now is it unmuted again? Beautiful. All right, so I've used WebEx since before Cisco bought it, quite a long time. It's not operator lack of ability to use WebEx. It's a very inadequate process. Uh, and there's really no excuse to not gather in the same room, even if it were under the basement in the giantest room that we have, uh, there's a space that this committee could do business. And frankly, it's the United States Congress. So if we need to rent out a freaking stadium, then we should be able to rent a stadium and operate. But for the fact that I happen to be in Washington, D.C., I would have no voice in this hearing. I just ran three blocks to get over here to actually have a voice that I would not have had due to the inadequacies of this proxy uh, absentee process. Frankly, the committee isn't even really convened, even though it would be easy to convene the committee and have all of you in one place, even if it was a big place, even if it was a different place, anywhere in the whole freaking planet. Uh, we could even go to Diego Garcia in the middle of the Indian Ocean if we had to. It's Congress. So with that, to the matter at hand. <clears throat> oh my goodness, all right, go ahead. So um, there are only three members of the Rules Committee that didn't vote for the previous process. All three are Democrats. Uh, everyone else voted for the bill that moved through the committee in March. I don't know the reasons why the Democrats didn't vote for it, but a lot of people who didn't vote for it didn't vote for it because it didn't have adequate protections for the Fourth Amendment. Since this, this committee last took up the topic, uh, the bill has been made better. In the Senate by Lee Leahy, which gives an amicus to more cases, not as strong as a lot of us wanted, but it's, uh, it's meaningful uh, progress. And in the Senate, we came close to uh, real reform to protect Americans' internet browser data from warrantless surveillance. So Zill Lofgren and I took that amendment up. We've worked uh, with leadership uh, across the spectrum to try to get something across the finish line. And um, as, as she has stated, uh, we've worked with the committee to adopt a process that really bridges the fact that we haven't had uh, regular order. Uh, this didn't go through the Judiciary Committee. Uh, it wasn't subject to debate and amendment. And we're trying to cobble together with central planners uh, the inadequate process of uh, the rules of the House. So here we are before the Rules Committee, um, basically apologizing for the fact that we aren't following the House rules. Um, but we, we, we certainly submit to the Rules Committee and say we would love to have this amendment made in order, uh, whatever variation makes progress. And that shows we're not absolutists. We're not out there trying to get Everything that uh, we believe uh, is, is really merited constitutionally, we hope the court gets there, uh, but we recognize the limits of what can advance across the floor. And that, that's disappointing because every single member of Congress swore an oath to support and defend the Constitution. Uh, you know, we all wanna keep our country safe. We all wanna keep uh, national security preeminent, uh, but we swore an oath to do that in a way that is constitutional. And, and so this is more constitutional uh, with the Lofgren-Davidson Amendment uh, than it is without it. Uh, I hope it kickstarts momentum behind 
bigger, more substantive reforms, uh, but it is a reform that anyone that voted for the bill before that directionally believes that we should get more constitutional should embrace. Uh, the only people that would not vote for this are the, the bipartisan coalition that has uh, the Intel Warhawks that frankly have pushed mass surveillance for nearly 20 years now, uh, and same coalition broadly with Warhawks that have America fighting endless wars, more wars in more places. So we, we have an opportunity to break some of that bipartisan coalition uh, that, that has had this grip on the country uh, and with a, with a different bipartisan coalition uh, that really just focuses on the Constitution and says, yes, we want to do these things, but we want to do them in a way that respects the Bill of Rights and the freedoms that make America, America. Um, and the, the last thing I'd say on this, the, there are some absolutists that say, I couldn't possibly vote for something that is more constitutional. It's either constitutional or not. And I respect their position. Uh, frankly, I'm tempted to be there, but I know uh, the limits of politics are what we can accomplish, uh, not necessarily what we should. It does give a sense of direction, and I hope we can move there. I sense, uh, Chairman McGovern, uh, you're in this camp that you would like to see a fully constitutional system. I would say that the tension that FISA represents going all the way back to 1978, when the underlying FISA bill was was enacted, uh, Ms. Lesko and uh, <clears throat> And, and uh, Mr. Armstrong have highlighted that, that FISA itself was put in place because, frankly, people like Attorney General Barr, who are Article II maximalists, that believe that under Article II, the executive branch has an absolute ability and responsibility to conduct any kind of surveillance on anyone, anywhere, anytime, using whatever means they have at their disposal. But the, the Bill of Rights was implemented precisely uh, because that's not true. It was a restriction on what the government, not just the legislative branch, but the entire U.S. government and post uh, 14th Amendment, any government can do to American citizens. And we see warrantless surveillance all over the country from stingray devices used by executive agencies and local police departments to uh, all the abuses that have been detailed by the federal government. It's time for us to reclaim the constitutional protections that our founders bequeathed us we need to uh, adopt the Lofgren-Davidson Amendment and many others to move this uh, forward. But I fear that if we don't take this chance to make this bill better, uh, we will wind up with an even more broken process. We'll let the Intel committees adopt their own reforms uh, and those reforms are clearly not sincere. In fact, you see the leaders uh, like Schiff uh, of the Intel community and uh, you know Cheney on, on, uh, on the Republican side who uh, could find a way to support the, the, the modest level of reform that was in the previous bill, working overtime to undermine this coalition right here, precisely because it does have more meaningful reforms. We need to reject this uh, broken status quo of mass surveillance and endless wars and uh, reclaim the protections that Americans are owed by their constitution. And I yield back. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Davidson. Appreciate it. Uh, and yeah, let me just say for the record that, um, you know, the standard that I try to adhere to is is is, cons is to is constitutional not more constitutional uh, and I think that's the standard we all should uh, try to adhere to so uh, in any event um, uh, I I have no questions mr. mr. Cole thank you for uh, bearing with me mr. chairman and uh, I too have no questions but I do want to thank our witnesses. Uh, I think they've been good witnesses. I really appreciate the amendments that have been offered. I think they have unquestionably made the bill a better bill. Uh, the reservation, I would, you know, we do have a legislative process here. And my big concern is while this is probably a better product at this point, uh, it's not likely to, uh, to reach the president's desk until he gives us a signal that his concerns have also been met. So, I think the legislative process is still underway on this, but again, the amendments that have been presented, I think unquestionably have made the bill better. And uh, so I thank our, our colleagues for that. I do wanna just note for the record, uh, uh, I, I had the chance to hear our good mutual friend, the gentle lady from California, Ms. Lofgren. And Zoe, I just wanna tell you, I just finished Richard Fenno's last book, The Challenge of Representation and uh, Congressional Representation. Uh, our colleague from California was one of the featured uh, people in that book. 
And uh, it uh, reminds me why I admire her so much as to what a great representative she is. And I appreciate my friend, Mr. Davidson, working across the aisle. Uh, that's a very unlikely alliance for people that know the, uh, the Congress of the United States, but it speaks well of both of them. Uh, their ability to work together to defend the Constitution, defend the rights of individual Americans in a very bipartisan way, even though on so many other issues they uh, probably are in different camps politically. So I think we're seeing actually some of the best of Congress here. Uh, but again, we're going to have to work harder, evidently, to actually reach a political consensus that can become reality. Because again, I do agree uh, this is a better product than uh, what we passed before. But evidently, at this point, it's still not a good enough product to get all the uh, assent that we need. But again, uh, very good testimony by all concerned. Mr. Chairman, thank you for uh, assembling the panel and uh, working through this with all of us. And uh, hopefully, this will push us closer to legislative consensus. Don't think we're there yet, but I think this hearing has contributed to moving in that direction. So I thank our witnesses and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Back. All right. Mr. Torres. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to make sure that um, we are done with the with the panels. I don't have any questions for the panels, but I do have a statement that I would like to um, be able to um, state. Perfect. Okay, uh, Mr. Woodall. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It uh, struck me that uh, we have four witnesses testifying, and three of them uh, advocated for wholesale reform uh, to say uh, we may be moving in the right direction, or uh, or in Mr. Gomert's case, uh, we're not uh, moving uh, far uh, enough, but if we had wholesale reform, we could really get to something that wasn't uh, uh, more constitutional, that was actually uh, constitutional, one that's something that protected uh, uh, national security and protected American citizens. But uh, Ms. Lofgren, that was, uh, was not the thrust of your testimony because folks have been lauding so much praise uh, on you for your intellect and your and your uh, 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 willingness to partner on difficult issues. Uh, could you tell me why do you think that we, we have it? You have the seniority uh, uh, amongst, uh, uh, certainly among the two members that I have sitting in front of me uh, uh, today. Uh, why do you think that we haven't as a Congress been able to come back, uh, start uh, from scratch and build a bipartisan coalition around FISA uh, as you and Mr. Davidson has done around your amendment? maybe more wisdom than I possess. Uh, we have tried Didn't. over the past years uh, to make significant reform uh, to a FISA, Section 702, Section uh, 215, and the like. There have been times when, uh, with amendments on uh, the floor, we have prevailed, times when we have not. But um, mostly, those reforms have not been supported by the Intelligence Committee, and they ultimately were never made part of the statute. So that's the history that we face. You know, I, I listened very closely to the other uh, witnesses, and, you know, I wish that this was a Fourth Amendment issue uh, because uh, I agree with Mr. Governor, we need. Um, a warrant to get <coughs> things. Unfortunately, we're stuck with the case of Smith v. Maryland, adopted in 1979 and extended beyond all rationality in my personal view. Uh, that case really was before the internet was a thing. And uh, it, it really says that these records are not protected by the Fourth Amendment, which is why we need to act in the statute to provide some, some protection. I think uh, that it would be a good thing uh, to go through the entire FISA statute. Knowing the history, it's possible that we might not achieve our goal of making this uh, friendlier uh, to the Fourth Amendment. It could, in fact, go in the other direction, given our failed efforts for the last 15 years, uh, which I've been a part of, as you know. Uh, out along with my partners on the other side of the aisle. Yeah, well, in a different hearing, we'll have to explore whether or not uh, folks who uh, who want to move in that uh, uh, in a more conservative uh, direction uh, actually have larger uh, have those larger fears, and and whether that does slow us.
slow us down. I, but where we are today, and candidly, 48 hours ago, I didn't expect to be here uh, today. I have my, my ranking member talking about the legislative process that continues to, to play out. I've got my president uh, 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 tweeting uh, uh, late night uh, thoughts and counsel. Uh, I did not. Uh, I did not anticipate this. So my question to you all, who have been working uh, uh, so uh, hard on this uh, in a partnership way, uh, I have not received any new notice uh, from Cindy Hoyer about what the schedule is today. I feel like we're going to go right on down this road anyway. Uh, for folks who have been trying to reach a productive solution, both for privacy and for national security. Do we disadvantage ourselves by having this vote uh, anyway? Is it, is it if, if we're not ready uh, to go, is uh, having this vote and, and defeating this bill or defeating uh, these amendments, is that helpful to us in some way? Each and every one of you testified about wanting to do a better job. Uh, I, sometimes we end up putting votes on the floor, we get cemented into our corners, and it makes it harder to come back and reach partnership later. So my question to you all who've been working in the trenches on this, does having this vote today, uh, as we talk about there still being more legislative consensus work to be done, does it advantage those of us trying to uh, reach a bipartisan uh, uh, reform or does it disadvantage us? And I'll, I'll start uh, with you, Mr. Davidson, uh, uh, as your name is on the amendment. Yeah, thanks, uh, Mr. Woodall. I appreciate the, the concern and I can share it. Um, you know, I, I was uh, hopeful that the president would see the reforms that are in the bill. Frankly, he seems supportive of the previous bill. Uh, this bill has more support than the previous bill. So rationally, the addition would be more supportive. But things have happened since that vote that may have moved him to say, I'm only going to sign something with even more reform. Uh, of course, the administration is not of like mind. Uh, Attorney General Barr. Uh, as more reform than the new range, and uh, this amendment then he's prepared to support, um, which is you know not surprising given his history on the issue, uh, but it is surprising given the president's history on the issue. So uh, what I hope that we do is we take counsel of our own civil office, and we if we put it on the floor, we vote in what we believe is moving us in the right direction. Uh, and, and then trust that perhaps, just like we've now seen this go from the House where this is all that could be accomplished, and it went to the Senate, and it was actually made better. And that was all that they could accomplish, short of one vote. Then it's come back to the House, and now it looks like we could accomplish even more. So maybe we can keep this uh, bottle going, and it'll turn into can protect Americans' privacy rights better, the House and the Senate. And the president will insist on being the biggest winner of all. Uh, and that will finally get us in the right direction. I hope that that may come true. They, I do see a, a game plan similar to that that's played out uh, historically. And so I have great, uh, I have great optimism that Mr. Davidson will. Do you want to go ahead and, and push forward and, and let the chips fall where they may? Yeah, I, so. I've lost a lot in my life. <laughs> it's something uh, you learn to do when you uh, do criminal defense. So I, I think, like I said, uh, when this whole process started, I'm not sure you could have found somebody in all 435 members of Congress. Congressman Davidson knows this, uh, more probably radical against FISA than I was. Um, I, and to kind of go on the question you asked, Congresswoman Lofgren, uh, it's very hard you have to do some real intellectual and legal gymnastics to say a foreign court that could ever have, or a, a secret court that could ever have jurisdiction over an American citizen satisfies Fourth Amendment concerns. I don't care what it's for. So when we have these constitutional conversations, I think we need to have them in reality. Uh, I think the problem with this is kind of what I said before. The politics and the policy are very divergent because of things that are going on and because of the parts of, of parts of FISA we are reauthorizing versus what we want reform to. Um, I, my guess is it's no secret that they're not um, brought up together as a whole group because um, if you do it part and parcel, you tend to have a better idea to do it. But I don't, know, I don't know if it's better or not. I know if this passes, the Senate will have a chance again for, like Congressman Davis had said, to work on it and make it even better. 
anything we're doing to protect I, more Fourth Amendment rights of U.S. citizens, I think, is a good idea. I just, I just know this: there will be more protections for U.S. citizens tomorrow, and better, better national security tomorrow if this thing passes. And if it doesn't, and it goes away, that's a bad thing. If it doesn't pass, and we continue to work towards more substantial reform, of course, that's a great thing. So, uh, I haven't been here as long as you all, so I have no idea what the next process is, particularly in the new environment. So, thank you. The, Ms. Lofgren, you probably have the ear of the Democratic leadership uh, more than Mr. Davidson or Mr. Armstrong uh, do. Uh, do you have any uh, uh, insight as to uh, whether pressing forward uh, today advantages the coalition you've been trying to, to put together uh, to create uh, reforms or, or whether it presses us uh, into our corners? Well, I would never uh, presume to speak for another member of Congress including uh, the leadership on either side of the aisle. But here's my view. I think that the uh, Lee-Leahy Amendment made improvements in the, uh, the bill. Um, they were uh, along the lines of the amendments that I had prepared for the Judiciary Committee before the markup was canceled. I think that the uh, Widen Dane's amendment, which Mr. Um, Davidson talked about on uh, May 20th as our first uh, choice, <clears throat> or the second amendment, uh, the Lofgren Davidson amendment relative to the persons before you as a second choice, would improve the situation. And I do think, as, as uh, Mr. Davidson has indicated, doing nothing actually. Sorry, is not your phone. Uh, constitutional protections. Uh, we have an attorney general who has a very expansive view of the of executive power, and uh, I think he is not in favor of the reforms that have been adopted in the Senate and that we are prepared to adopt here. Uh, you know, he's entitled to his view, but we're the legislative branch, and I and we are the ones that decide what protections to put in place. And I think if we're able to come together to accomplish that, it would be a service to the country. And that's just my view. I hope that answers your question. Mr. Chairman, I'm reminded that we often have uh, witnesses who try to stand up and leave the witness table when they finish their testimony, and you have to remind them that uh, uh, once you've testified, you have to stick with us until the end of the uh, the questioning. As I uh, think about our uh, uh, witnesses being dispersed across the Capitol these days, I, I am wondering what the uh, digital equivalent uh, is uh, uh, so that folks don't just close their screen and go on around the about the rest of their uh, their business, but I will leave that in your capable hands if this process uh, continues going forward. Uh, I know Luke has got hundreds of things he could be doing uh, uh, right now, and he's stuck. Uh, he's stuck with us, and I'm I'm grateful. Yeah. I'm back, Mr. Can I respond to your question. Oh, I'm sorry, Louis. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, in my mind, is it's quite clear going forward with this vote today disadvantages us. It says like we did in 2005. We're just lemmings. We, we, we just follow along. We give you all these tools and trust that nobody's going to abuse them. And I, I do want to see America protected. And I do thank a great deal of Attorney General Barr. But uh, and, and I am familiar with what this high court has said about uh, what has pr protected private material and what isn't. But as I learned in constitutional law, the Supreme Court is not the only arbiter of what is constitutional and what isn't. Uh, the Supreme Court can say something is constitutional, and we can come back and say, we're not satisfied it's constitutional. We're going to change it so we believe it is. And I think that's our responsibility on the FISA court. And it disadvantages us to be able to make the kind of reforms we could if we, on a bipartisan basis, stood together and said, you know, here's some good changes, but let's fix the process. And even though the whole thing is not up for reauthorization, by not going to the vote today, it, advantage, it would advantage us, and we would be able to say, okay, these other parts that need fixing are not up for reauthorization, but if you want these parts reauthorized, Here's what we've got to fix. We could do that 
but if we go forward with the vote and it passes, we've given up that chance. Thank you for asking me. Thank you, Mr. Gomer. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Mr. Perlmutter. Thanks, Mr. Chair. And a uh, couple things. Uh, uh, Zoe, if you could get a little closer to your mic, I think that might be helpful. And I and none of us should be bashful. And I was a little bashful in 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 doing that, but uh, uh, that would be helpful. And um, I think we're also learning that if uh, somebody is in the same room with the panelist, the uh, witness, and each of you has your mics on, there is feedback. So if we, to the degree, as we go through this process, which is not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, um, just kind of remember that I think that'll be helpful so we don't have feedback. Third thing I wanna talk about is I really do appreciate the lectures, the constitutional lectures that, uh, we have been given, and I say that sort of tongue in cheek, but not in. But also, I appreciate uh, the positions that uh, you have all taken on uh, privacy. I think this amendment uh, certainly uh, bolsters uh, the privacy aspects of uh, FISA uh, legislation, and I appreciate that. And I would have gone farther too with the uh, with the Wyden amendment um, if that had been uh, accepted. But on balance, uh, I have believed that this is constitutional, not more constitutional. And, um, you know, it's not perfect, but I think that the, the, the security components of it are important and the privacy components are important. So I'd ask my friend, Mr. Davidson, and uh, Mr. Cole, you should be aware that uh, Mr. Davidson and I are carrying several things together. Um, and we work well together. My question to you, sir, and I appreciate your being exasperated today when you had to race over from your office, uh, but we're living in uncharted times and, and no, I don't wanna go to Diego Garcia uh, to have a hearing on FISA legislation. So I disagree with you on that. I support your amendment. My question to you is with this amendment, um, do you, and whether the president's tweeting or not tweeting, that doesn't stop the Congress from moving forward or not. If he vetoes it, he vetoes it. That's the way it goes. But it doesn't stop us from moving forward with our, our legislation. Um, do you support this legislation? Do you, you kept saying it's more constitutional. Does it um, reach a level where you, you believe somebody like you, let's not, you'll do whatever you do, but somebody like you, who is a privacy, um, really focused on privacy, uh, can support this legislation. Uh, thanks for the question, uh, Mr. Perlmutter, and you know, appreciate uh, the chance to work with, with you and you know, frankly, uh, you know, so Lofgren, you and a number of other Democrats I've worked with <clears throat> have, uh, you know, break the mold that uh, everything's all party lines. Uh, there is a good spirit uh, to work together to get uh, meaningful things done on behalf of the American people, and uh, it, it's an honor to be able to be here to be part of that. And and so I think that this is a, a step in the right direction. I, I, you know, I, I as I tried to highlight, I think purists would say it, it's, we've got a long ways to go. Um, but I, I do believe this is a bill that uh, is made better. Uh, and unlike the last bill where I didn't support it, uh, I believe this bill is something I would vote for. It's a meaningful reform, and you can tell that it's meaningful because you see people like Adam Schiff and, and Liz Cheney opposed to it. <laughs> Barr, who was for it, now is opposed to it. So you can tell we're getting to actual reform, uh, not just by the allies, but by the opponents. And so, uh, I, you know, the, the purpose of supporting it isn't because, uh, it, you know, of that. It's just, I believe it's about as far as we can push the envelope right now. And I hope that, as I say, maybe if this volley were to continue and we move it across the floor in the House, what the Senate says, no, we can one-up you guys and we can protect Americans' privacy even better. Great. And at the end, as the president loves to do, uh, to be winning, uh, you can say, no, we have to do even more and push for more. But directionally, we're going the right way, and I believe in, in taking ground where we can. Uh, I was a human, and sometimes those fights uh, turn out to be games of inches and, and uh, short gains, and every now and then they're giant leaps. So I, I hope for a giant leap. I'm looking for the open receiver downfield that we can get. 
but we'll we'll check off and take this win where we can get it. In my opinion, I'd vote for. Him. Okay. Well, I thank you for that. And uh, before I yield back, I just want to make sure that Mr. Cole and and Mr. McGovern uh, have seen the banner in the background here in my office. Welcome to colorful Colorado. And you know, I look at that Boomer Sooner mask, and I've looked at the Patriots mask. I just want to make sure that uh, you all uh, know you're welcome to colorful Colorado anytime. And I yield back. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Dr. Burgess. Well, sure. Thank you. And I guess if we're advocating for our states, um, I'd just offer that uh, instead of Diego Garcia, we could come to Texas Motor Speedway down in uh, uh, North Texas, and it would accommodate a vast number of uh, constituents and members, and uh, we'd have all kinds of open space on the infield grass and we'd be able to socially distance to our heart's content and still gather as the founders intended. <laughs> Do what? Would you help me get a visa? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. There might be a problem there, Chairman. Um, so look, this has really been a fascinating discussion this morning. And, you know, just thinking back, this law started, what, in 1978? And the challenges, the enemies, the world stage was different. The technology, no question about it, was vastly different. So. It strikes me with all of the work that's been done on this, this will continue to be a work in progress. I'm always striving to protect our, our our nation against enemies foreign and trying to keep up with the changes in technology. I, I don't know that the people who drafted the initial law could have ever really imagined us doing stuff like we're doing this morning with a virtual hearing on WebEx, on iPads and, and laptops. So it is a it is an enormous challenge, and I'm actually saying this to express my gratitude to everyone, uh, Ms. Lofgren, Ms. Tagomer, who are not here, and our two witnesses who are here, Mr. Davidson, uh, and the gentleman from North Dakota. Thanks for working so hard on this. It it is it is important, and it is important that we continue to try to get it right. And I think it's important that we recognize that what may be right today may not be right because of a change in some aspect of the challenges that our nation faces or our technology in the future. So thank everyone for their participation and work on this today. I wish we could have gathered in person over in the Rules Committee with Mr. McGovern, but we didn't. And uh, I look forward to us being able to do that in the, in the near future. So thanks everyone and Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. Thank you very much, and I appreciate it. I should just remind everybody, the reason why we're not gathering on the Rules Committee is we're following the advice of the attending physician, and uh, as the gentleman knows, the Rules Committee is not large enough to accommodate all of us, but I, too, hope that we can get uh, back to reconvening uh, in person in the Rules Committee uh, in the very, very near future. I think we all want that. Um, Mr. Raskin. Mr. Chairman, thank, thank you. you. I, I have uh, no questions at this point. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Lesko. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. You can hear you good. Awesome. Loud and clear. Fantastic. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Chairman, as I've told you before in person, I, I've always found you to be a fair uh, person. Don't don't always agree with you philosophically, but I think you're fair on the committee. And so maybe uh, I think you might want to consider maybe technology people or something pre-testing our laptop before we have this hearing, because it really is difficult for a while there, even though I had unmuted myself, it, it didn't work and you couldn't hear me. And so then they were working on my computer and then I couldn't hear the testimony of Ms. Lofgren. And so I really missed out on on part of the hearing. And so if we're not going to do this in person, I mean, this room certainly is big enough for us to do it in person and to social distance. But if we're not going to do it in person, may I suggest that everybody's technology be tested out in advance? Because the one that I did on the test last week, um, that was at my home computer, you know, but I had to be here in Washington, D.C. 
in order to, you know, vote, right? And so it's not the same setup as I have used for a couple months now at home that I know is working. Um, but anyway, and it's unfortunate that Mr. Davidson had to like run over here because his internet wasn't working. It's just not a good process. So I think we need to think this through a little bit more. Well, I, I, I think I need to say, I, I, think, I think practice makes perfect and we're gonna work out the glitches. Um, and, uh, and so um, I, no one's under any illusion that everything is you know, gonna go perfectly the first time around. But, uh, you know, um, you know. I, I should also just say that it's, um, you know, um, uh, it's, well, it's, it's, it's not just about uh, finding a place that's big enough. It's also about limiting the number of members traveling. And we're again, we're trying to, uh, we're trying to find a way, at least in the short term here, and hopefully this is a very, very sh short term issue, uh, to to operate safely. Um, and if need be, if things get worse in the fall, and I hope that they don't. Uh, that we uh, we we have a process in place that will allow us to to move forward and do our business. I mean that's what this is about, and I I, I don't quite understand why there's so much controversy over it, over this. But I, I get the I get the I get I, I hear loud and clear some of the technical glitches, and we're going to work those things out. Uh, but uh, and we will work with you uh, if we do another one of these virtual hearings. We will certainly uh, have staff re reach out to you. Uh, to work out your technical glitches and to try to make sure that everybody uh, can not only uh, listen to all the testimony but also be heard when they speak. So I thank the general lady for yielding and I um, yield the floor back to her. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do have a question for Mr. Davidson. Um, Mr. Davidson, I got um, two groups that have sent us emails. One is for the bill with your amendments and another one is against the bill with your amendment and this one is from uh, demand progress i'm not familiar with this group at all I have no idea which uh, if it's liberal leaning or conservative leaning or what it is but in it it says to oppose the law for and davidson amendment and to oppose the usa freedom reauthorization act and in it it specifically said we oppose the law for and davidson amendment because it is not compar comparable the Senate Danes widened amendment, which would have drawn a bright line to prohibit warrantless FBI surveillance of internet search and browser history under Section 215. Danes widened received 59 votes in the Senate and has the support of 61 senators. Can you, Mr. Davidson and Ms. Lofgren as well, can you address if this is accurate or not? What they're yeah, the, the distinction uh, between Danes Wyden as drafted in the Senate and uh, the Lofgren Davidson amendment, I guess, as amended uh, was to get support. We made it limited to U.S. persons. Uh, U.S. persons is all through the FISA statute. Uh, U.S. persons is obviously U.S. citizens, but it's uh, lawful people like green card holders. It also includes businesses. Uh, that are U.S. domiciled, uh, you know, incorporated entities. Uh, so the protections uh, go uh, in a way that is targeted at U.S. Uh, persons uh, to, to include, you know, those constitutional protections. Uh, their objection was that it, and it's a progressive group generally, uh, that, that uh, their objection is that it doesn't necessarily cover uh, or explicitly cover people like dreamers uh, who, who status isn't well-defined. Uh, in law or people that are in the United States, but here illegally. Uh, so the broader language, uh, which has been upheld in jurisprudence. Uh, so you have, you have case law that would say that the, you know, these activities inside the United States of America are protected. And I'd say further, uh, Mr. Schiff uh, has attempted to fracture the coalition by stating things that he knows to be false, which frankly, in my opinion, wouldn't be the first time that he's used such tactics. But he says that, well, we could just sweep up all these uh, IP addresses and and uh, we could continue to conduct mass surveillance, which is explicitly prohibited, as Ms. Lofgren, uh, uh, you know, highlighted uh, without naming the names of the people that were making the case. But that's really what, what spun up the groups. And so it's fractured some of the coalition where progressives are concerned that we aren't protecting dreamers, for example, and aren't going with a broad piece of language. I believe that the case law will continue to likely be the case law. Personally, I'm fine limiting it to U.S. persons. I believe citizenship matters. 
uh, and the lawful jurisdiction that our Constitution affords is for lawful residents of the United States. Uh, that isn't always how the case law has been adjudicated, though. So that's that's the conflict and why you saw groups like the ACLU and Demand Progress start to break off from you know other groups that have put together this broad coalition that supported our original letter. I think 80 signers to our original letter. If, if I can uh, add, um, our first preference uh, was reflected in our letter of May 20th, which was to adopt essentially the mirror of the widened um, Baines Amendment in the Senate. As uh, Mr. Davidson has indicated, uh, we uh, did have some discussion with the chair of the House Intelligence Committee who proposed a limitation to U.S. persons. Uh, I think the concern of the demand progress group, and I have a copy of their letter, is that somehow uh, this is not a clear, bright line in the same way uh, uh, that the uh, widened Danes Amendment was in the House, and that somehow, despite the clear language of the amendment, that the intelligence agencies would somehow skew the application of the statute to allow for um, the collection of IP addresses even uh, if they had intention, no intentionality or reasonable belief, which is not in the amendment. But given the history of the intelligence agencies uh, really misusing the plain language of statutes to obtain information that they had no right to do, the sad history, I, I understand the concern and it's why we originally had suggested the other amendment, and we'd be happy to go back to that uh, today. Um, I will also note, however, that in the Lee Leahy Amendment, there is a provision that says if there is going to be a novel interpretation of the law, that an amicus needs to be appointed and the court needs to review it. So there at least is in the underlying statute some protection against the agencies basically just completely uh, uh, blowing up the clear words of the statute that uh, is being proposed here. I would note, and I'm sure Mr. Gomert would agree, that the Constitution protects everybody who's here. Uh, no matter what, if you're a tourist uh, coming by, you still have due process under the Constitution. If you're a, a, a tourist on vacation in Texas, you still have uh, you know, rights at the, uh, uh, to confront the witnesses against you. All of those, first, those uh, Bill of Rights amendments apply. I think the Fourth Amendment applies to anyone in the U.S. Uh, as well. The problem is that the business records have not been interpreted uh, by the court or by this Congress as having the full protection of the Fourth Amendment, which is why uh, throughout the FISA statute, uh, U.S. persons get protection in ways that everyone else does not. For example, the um, roving wiretap provision and the others that I mentioned in my original testimony. So in short, I think the preferable route would be to do the original request that Mr. Um, Davidson and I asked for. It's a clear, bright line, but if we are unable to gain consensus for that, uh, we propose as a compromise the uh, limitation to U.S. citizens. And it's up to the Rules Committee to figure this out. Uh, luckily, I'm not a member of the Rules Committee, so you will figure out how we can proceed and gain consensus and get to a good place for our country. And with that, I yield back to Jeff. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Lofgren and uh, Mr. Davidson. Uh, you know, my thought, I voted for the House um, FISA reform bill last time, I think it was in March, because I think it's better to have reforms than no reform. And um, I think that the Senate amendment has made it better. And I think that Mr. Davidson and Ms. Lofgren, I think your amendment makes it even better. Um, and so I hope this gets resolved so that we don't go back to, I think what Mr. Armstrong said, where we don't do anything. And then we have the status quo, um, and uh, that would be unfortunate. 
So thank you, and I yield back. Thank you, and uh, and since uh, demand progress and the ACLU were were mentioned, I, I think we should uh, ask unanimous consent to insert their statement and letter in the record without objection. Uh, Ms. Scanlon. Fine, thanks. Okay, uh, Mr. Morelli. I'm fine, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, Ms. Shalala. I'm fine, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Ms. Matsui. Yes. Okay. Um, are there any other questions for this uh, panel? Uh, seeing none, I, I want to thank all the uh, panelists, and um, and I am uh, I am grateful to your uh, for your uh, for your statements, and uh, you are excused. Um, and um, at this point, I, I think Mr. Torres had uh, requested an opportunity to make give a statement, and at this point, um, we to her. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and um, since we're we're all airing our our uh, frustrations uh, with with the system, I just want to tell you that I too had my setup at home, um, but here in D.C. I don't have the same setup. However, yesterday I was very easily uh, I was able to download the app on my iPhone. Um, thank you to your staff for providing the link um, to do that. I tested the system. Um, last night, even though I was not able to get onto the meeting because the meeting had not started. Um, I just want to thank everyone for giving us this opportunity um, to participate uh, virtually. I hope you're enjoying um, the, the my district. Um, I was messing with, uh, with the backgrounds uh, while all of you were talking as I was listening to you. So I hope you enjoy the 35th Congressional District. Um, to my statement, two weeks ago, this committee met to consider the HEROES Act, a bill uh, to bring emergency relief for Americans struggling through the COVID pandemic. That bill, unfortunately, awaits the Senate action because Leader McConnell doesn't believe that Americans need help. Instead, the Senate has been busy appointing partisan Republican judges with very little experience to no experience on the bench and a new Trump loyalist with barely any intelligence experience to oversee U.S. intelligence agencies. I am pleased that Leader McC McConnell took a break from installing Trump loyalists to actually pass a piece of legislation for the House to consider. The FISA reauthorization is important because the American people have been debating the provisions since the Patriot Act was passed in the aftermath of 9-11. It is an essential conversation for our national security, for our due process, but also for ensuring our government is truly accountable to the people, to the American people. Surveillance is a potent tool for our intelligent community. The ability to gather information is critical to our broader efforts to protect the American people. But it comes hand in hand with civil liberty challenges that we must address. To this bill's credit, it makes great strides to protect against abuses of surveillance powers. It ends the ability for the NSA to collect call detail records. It puts new protections in place for geolocation information and prohibits the government from reinstating certain surveillance materials for more than five years. And while the FISA reauthorization has bipartisan support, it is not without controversy. When this committee met last March to consider this bill, I raised concern, concerns over a provision dealing with how members of Congress are treated differently. Section 203 requires Attorney General Bill Barr to sign off on any FISA surveillance targeting a federal office holder, such as members of Congress, us. This provision is still in the bill. And I still don't understand why this provision or why members think that we are so special. Members of Congress should not be above the law. The President of the United States should not be above the law. No one is above the law. I will go even further and say that I don't trust this attorney general to act as a safeguard. He has proven otherwise. 
I don't want to use my time to go through all of the ways the Attorney General has undermined the public and the traditional independence of the Department of Justice. We're here to talk about FISA. So I will just say that we as federal officials are not above the law and should not get special status under the FISA court. We should be held to the same standard as all Americans under the FISA court. What's good enough for my neighbors should be good enough for me and the rest of you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Thank you very much. Are there any other members who want to testify or who have anything they want to say? Uh, Mr. Chairman? Mr. Woodall. They, I was looking for those uh, statements uh, for the record, uh, the, the ACLU statement and the demand progress uh, statements. Are those in the Dropbox uh, yet? I, we sent them. They'll be, up shortly. They'll be up shortly for you. Okay, thank you very much. They'll be, yeah. Any other statements or comments? Uh, let, me, let me just conclude by thanking everybody uh, for, um, for their, their patience and for going through this process virtually. I want to thank, again, our witnesses, and uh, I want to thank our members for their questions. I want to thank the staff. You know, this is a, this is a, a difficult issue, uh, and it doesn't uh, divide along party lines. I mean, as I said before, I mean, we have Democrats who um, are in favor of Pfizer and Democrats who are opposed. We have Republicans who are in favor of Pfizer and, and Republicans who are opposed. Uh, but I think all of us um, have strong opinions on this, uh, and. And I'm not sure that some of the divides can be uh, can be bridged. Um, uh, and so, uh, you know, we're going to have to uh, take all what we heard under consideration, uh, and then decide how we move forward. Um, so, um, I, I'm going to. I don't know when we're going to reconvene, uh, but uh, when we recess, we will. Um, uh, when we reconvene, we'll meet um, in um, in uh, two one six seven Rayburn. Um, you know, for any markup, um, I will I, I, I will work with the ranking member to make sure that we're giving people enough time. But uh, we'll get and we can give at least 15 minutes. If you want longer, we can do that as well. But we'll 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 we'll, we'll talk um, about uh, what what time members need uh, to to reconvene. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Without, Chairman. Yes, Mr. Cole. I would ask, I think 15 minutes, just given the difficulties we have right now, be a little short. So if we could extend that time to some degree, I, I, I think okay. our members would require a little yeah. bit more notice than that. All right. Well, we'll get, yeah. So what we'll, we'll do is we'll, we'll stay in touch with you to figure out what a, an appropriate. Appreciate time is. that very much, Mr. Chairman. We want to be accommodating. So without objection, the committee stands in recess subject to the call of the chair. <laughs>